Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Joseph Wang. Joseph is a former senior trader on the open market desk at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York and the author of the book Central Banking 101. He also blogs at fedguy.com and is active on Twitter. Joseph joins us today to discuss what is happening at the Fed from the operational side, and we consider its implications for money markets with him. Joseph, thank you for joining the show. Hey, David. Thanks for inviting me. I'm a big fan of your show, and I'm really excited to be on it. It's great to have you on. I've been following your articles you've been posting at thefedguide.com. I highly recommend folks check it out if you are interested in the plumbing of the monetary system and how that interacts with money markets. And you'll see in today's show, we're going to get into that. So Joseph has a really great understanding of that. And uh, moreover, Joseph worked on the front lines of this, right? You were at the trading desk from 2016 up until recently. I mean, you were the frontline troops for the Federal Reserve System in the money markets. Is that fair? That's right. I was there in the morning of the repo spike in 2019 and all throughout the COVID crisis. So it was definitely very much on the front lines. So what was it like during those times? I mean, let's go back to September 2019, for example. I mean, were you there when the repo market froze up? Did you have long hours, sleepless nights? What was it like to be someone on, on that desk during that time? Yeah, I was actually the first person on the desk at that time. I arrived at 7 a.m. And immediately, which is that's when the repo market opened, immediately I received a call from a dealer telling me something about the repo market, reasonably high, it's not very normal. And so I sat down and I logged into my computer to take a look. Could be something serious or it could be just another dealer complaining. For those of you who don't know, the open market says basically open lines of communication with all the primary dealers. And just as I was logging in, I immediately received another call from a dealer. I picked it up and I was about to hear what he was about to say. And the phone line started ringing again. Two more people were calling. The phone was basically lighting up like a Christmas tree. You had people calling and saying, I've been in this market for like 20 years and I've never seen anything like this. You guys got to take a look at this. And so for context, the repo rates like day before about two, a little bit more than 2% and they were doubling. And so that was not normal. A repo market is normally kind of a sleepy market. You can see it move all around, say, 5, 10 basis points on a day to day, but it's not supposed to double. And so that really was kind of a big thing. And when I opened the screens and I saw what they were saying was true, then I knew that something big was happening and I had to escalate it. And as you know, eventually the, the open markets just came in and we did an operation to try to put some downward pressure on the rates. But that was probably a couple hours later. Yeah, I remember that incident well. There was news about, you know, why is the Fed taking so long to respond in the morning? Like by 9 a.m. or so, you guys intervened. And what's interesting also, I'm glad to have you on the show, is you effectively were doing these temporary repo operations, which is now formalized in the standing repo facility. So you're doing a temporary version of it. And maybe we could even say a trial run of something similar to that. So when we get to that, I want to ask you a little bit more about the operational details of how the now permanent facility is set up and what you think about that. But you were there, so you were on the front line. So just to flesh this story out a little bit more, and I know maybe you can't share all the details, but what authority do you have? Do you have the authority to go ahead and do the trade or you got to get permission from above? How does it work? No, no. So at that point in time, the Fed hadn't done any repos since the crisis in 2008, right? So for the Fed to start intervening again, it, it takes, I think, approval from the very highest level. So at that time, you know, seven o'clock, everyone was kind of asleep. And so it takes some time to escalate for get all the important people online, to praise them of the situation. And it's a discussion between the New York Fed and the Board of Governors as to whether or not they should intervene and the exact level that they should intervene at. So let's say 50 or 100 billion and so forth. So it's a discussion. And basically, it really has to be proved at the very highest level. And so that takes time. You know, the Fed is a big, large bureaucracy. So eventually, they did come in, like you said, around after nine. And at that time, you know, the repo market's a very early market. So at that time, it did help, but it would have been a lot helpful if it was earlier. Most trades in repo are done before, let's say, nine o'clock. Okay. And that's why we have this standing repo facility, I guess, for future events like this, should they occur. So again, we'll come back to the standing repo facility in a bit. 
Now, you also survived and endured the March 2020 dash for cash, as they say, (laughs) where the treasury market, the supposedly safest, steepest market in the world, came under stress. You witnessed that as well, correct? Yeah, that was a very exciting time on the desk. I hate to say this, but usually money markets is kind of a sleepy place, and it only becomes exciting when something big is happening in the markets. We do these calls with the Board of Governors, but we brief them every day on conditions in the money markets. And if you look at things, something like LIBOR or Fed funds, usually it's kind of a snooze fest and no one really calls in, no one really pays attention. But I remember at that time in March, you had so many people calling in to hear our briefing that the system literally couldn't handle it. And that's an overflow. And so you have people from Fed presidents, you have members of the Board of Governors all coming calling in. So it was a very exciting time. And you got to see the Fed in action in real time. So from my perspective, it was a really interesting experience. So you're involved in the money markets directly. I mean, you you execute trades. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's right. Once you got the approval from above, you execute the trades. And you mentioned already repo. You're involved in the repo transactions. I'm curious about you know the dollar swap lines and all the other facilities that were set up. Were you also a part of that? So the desk does that, but I do not participate. Those are different teams. So we have teams at international markets who operate the FX swap lines. We have people who do the QE purchases in treasuries and MBS. But for me, I was on the money markets desk and I studied financial system, banks, and money markets. Yeah, and that's... What's reflected in your writing, it's very clear you have a deep understanding of the U.S. money markets and very much informed by experience. I mean, you had to learn through the school of hard knocks (laughs) firsthand how these things work. So a lot of great wisdom you carry into your writing. Okay, so very fascinating. Maybe we'll come back to some of these experiences that you lived firsthand as we walk through these topics. But you have a series of posts I want to talk with you about, and I encourage listeners, take a look at this really fun stuff at fedguy.com. And I want to start with what's been happening to the Federal Reserve over the past, a little over a year actually now, but what's happened since March 2020. And you could maybe argue all the way back to September 2019, things were changing then as well. But really, things you know blew up in March 2020 since then. So if we just look at the size of the Fed's balance sheet, total assets went from $4.1 trillion to $8.3 trillion, so more than double the size of the Fed's balance sheet. If we look at treasuries, $2.4 trillion to $5.3 trillion. So Fed's been a big purchaser of treasuries. Reserves have gone from about a $1.5 trillion to $4 trillion. I mean, it's a lot of reserves in the banking system. And then everyone knows that every month the Fed is purchasing $120 billion worth of assets, which means $120 billion worth of reserves being pushed into the system again. And we'll get to some of your posts where you talk about the pressures this is creating and, you know, and how they've had to turn the overnight reverse repurchase facility into something that wasn't originally meant to be, a more permanent than temporary facility, it seems like at this point. But they've been very busy, and now there's talk of tapering coming on. Maybe they'll dial this down a bit. We are recording this August 25th. You know, just in a few days, Chair Powell will be giving a speech at Jackson Hole, and and maybe he'll announce tapering. Maybe he won't. There's some debate about that. But we think maybe by the September FOMC meeting, maybe they'll make some announcements then. So I think the show will come out by then. So we're, we're kind of speculating at this point. But a lot has been happening and, again, created these side effects, maybe unintended effects in money markets. And I want to begin our conversation with a post you titled, QE Zombifies Money Markets. So QE is turning money markets into a zombie market. And you begin with the two-tiered money system. So maybe start with that. What do you mean by a two-tiered money system? Yeah, so one of the key things in understanding our monetary system is to realize We actually have a two-tiered monetary system where we have one tier, which is reserves, which is basically money held by banks, and another tier, bank deposits, which is money held by non-banks. So when you and me talk about having money, what we're really thinking about is bank deposits. It's the stuff that we have in our checking account. Now, for a bank, though, money are reserves, and reserves are created by the Fed when they purchase an asset or maybe they make a loan. And in a similar way, bank deposits are created by commercial banks when they either make a loan or purchase an asset. These two types of money are connected through the commercial banks who own reserves and owe bank deposits. So one of the things that QE does, and QE is intended to put downward pressure on longer dated yields, yes, but another way you can look at QE is that when the Fed does $1 of QE purchases, because the Fed transacts with reserves, it creates a reserve to make that purchase. But that reserve at the end of the day ends up on a commercial bank's balance sheet as an asset. 
and it's balanced by a bank deposit liability. So $1 of QE actually creates $2 of money, $1 of reserves, and $1 of bank deposits. So when you're doing like a trillion dollars of QE, you're actually creating $2 trillion of money. Now, the interaction between this two-tiered system and Basel III creates a dynamic that essentially zombifies money markets. Basel III is a set of regulations that came out after they did the GFC. The GFC was widely viewed as a banking crisis or a run on the entire financial sector. And in order to make the banks safer, the regulators came up with a set of regulations known as Basel III, which essentially limited the size and composition of a bank's balance sheet. There was something called an SLR, a supplementary leverage ratio that limited the size of a bank's balance sheet. And you also had regulations like capital requirements and liquidity coverage requirements that limited the composition of the assets and liabilities. So one of the regulations, the LCR, mandates that banks hold a very large HQLA portfolio, a portfolio of high quality liquid assets. This portfolio was intended so that the bank could have enough liquidity to cover any run situation. And there's a set of assets that banks can hold that qualify that among those are treasuries and reserves. So post Basel III, banks are required to have very large HQA portfolios that are essentially kind of like money market fund assets. So they can hold reverse repo with backed by treasuries, they can hold reserves, they can hold treasuries, and they can hold slightly lower quality HQA, let's say agency and BS, but in practice, it tends to be the highest quality level one HQLA assets. So what happens is that when you do QE and you greatly expand the level of reserves in the system and the level of bank deposits, then these two portfolios, the HQA portfolios and the portfolios held of money held by non-banks overlap the most in the money markets. So when Fed does QE, the non-bank sector has a lot more money, right? For every let's say a trillion dollars of QE, there's roughly about a trillion dollars in bank deposits. Not exactly, but usually. And that money can be used to rebalance the portfolios. Maybe they buy more corporate bonds, maybe they buy more equities. And that's part of the mechanism of the portfolio rebalancing impact of QE. But the banks get stuck with a trillion dollars of reserves as well. And because of Basel III, banks are very limited in the kind of assets that they hold. But the only segment of the market where the commercial banks and the non-banks overlap is in the money market space. And so that is why QE has a very large impact on money market rates. And essentially, when you have a large QE, money market rates all become pushed to lower bound, as we've seen not just in America, but throughout the world, in Japan, North Chilean, and so forth. So banks, which operate the HQLA portfolio, that basically, in a way, like they were a giant government money market fund, hurdle rate of IOR, which right now is 15 basis points, whenever money market rates poke up above IOR, banks become lending in large scale in the, in the money markets. And you saw that in 2018 to 2019, when repo rates rose above IOR, you saw JP Morgan in particular lending hundreds of billions of dollars into the money markets. And at the same time, you have the surge in bank deposits. And if you have a lot of bank deposits, usually people put them somewhere safe, especially if you have more than FDIC insurance limits. So that causes a surge in money market fund assets. And money market fund assets also invest in the same assets as HQLA assets, except that they have a hurdle rate of the RRP floor. So what you end up is a situation where above IOR, you have trillions of dollars of bank HQA portfolios looking to invest. And above RRP, you have trillions of dollars of money market funds looking to invest. And so inevitably, that leads to money market rates floored at the lower bound. The converse of that, of course, is that when you do QT, when you start drawing out, you start reversing QB, the impact is strongest in the money markets because for every $1 of QB you take out, you're taking out $1 reserves and $1 bank deposits. And when the marginal bank deposit is in a money market fund, you are essentially drawing $2 from the money markets. And so that's why what you saw at the outcome of QT, the biggest impact wasn't in, let's say, longer dated rates, but what happened was in the overnight money markets. That's fascinating. So the two-tiered money system, so banks have access to reserves and only banks do themselves. And then all the non-banks, you and me have access to deposit money, bank-created money. And I think I heard you say is that since QE is creating so much of both and banks are limited, banks go into the money market space, but so are a lot of the deposit dollars. There are also, there's demand for money market assets from both sectors. Is that right? And so that's helping push down yeah. the yields. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. And so pre-crisis, reserves are used, mostly used to make payments. But post-crisis and post-Basel III, the level of reserves is so high 
and the demand for HPLA is so high that reserves take a role beyond just settling payments. They are basically a pool of capital that is allocated into investments, and that can only be allocated into money market fund investments because of the HQLA regulations. And so you create a huge pool of assets held by banks that can only buy money market fund assets. And then at the flip side, you also create a whole bunch of non-banks who take their deposits and invest them into money market funds who also demand money market fund assets. Yeah, that's interesting. So that kind of puts a new spin on the other name that's often given for reserves. Like if you go to Canada, they call them settlement balances, right? Well, what you just said is, well, they're really not settlement balances anymore. They're just an asset they're trying to allocate across the high quality liquid assets. I mean, they are settlement balances between banks, but they're playing this much bigger role in QE. And you have another post that tells a similar story. The gravitational pull is zero, how these GSIB, these big, systematically important banks, because of all these regulations, they're going into money markets. Walk us through this story that I think ultimately will lead us to their overnight reverse repurchase facility. But as this push for funds in money markets grows, and again, it's, it's coming ultimately from QE. QE is creating this pressure. It's going through banks. It's going through non-bank and the demand for money markets. What are the mechanics of actually pushing down interest rates? So, and maybe bring in money market funds, and then you can weave this, I guess, into the overnight reverse repo facility as well. Yeah. So, the connection between the overnight markets and the longer dated markets, one of the mechanisms that connect them is the bank HQA portfolios that I've been talking about, since there are large pools of capital that can only buy basically treasuries, reserves, or first repo. In general, many things drive longer dated rates, right? But one mechanism is these HQA portfolios. And what happens is that you have a kind of a captive pool of capital here held by banks that can only buy so many assets. And when they see that reserves are yielding, let's say, 15 basis points, reverse repo, five basis points. In the past, when repo was higher than IOR, you will see them allocating reserves to reverse repo. Now that reverse repo is lower than IOR, they don't really do that anymore. But what is higher than IOR that they can buy are treasuries. And agency MBS. So one of the things that you see as a consequence of these just massive QE and very low levels of IOR is a shift in some GC portfolios towards longer dated treasuries. One of the ways you can clearly see this is by looking at the regulatory filings. Every quarter, the GC banks file their regulatory holdings and they show the level of treasuries and agency MBS holds. And over the past year, you've seen a very significant shift in how they manage those HQA portfolios. In the past, commercial banks usually don't buy treasuries, longer dated treasuries. They usually stay probably in the like, two to five year segment, and they don't have very many treasuries to begin with because they usually have better investment options. But you've seen the GSIPs as a whole are buying a lot more treasuries and agency MBS. And Bank of America in particular, over the past year, I think they've increased their portfolio by about $400 billion. Not all GSIPs are behaving this way, but some are. And you can kind of see that chase for yield pushing down treasury yields because it forces them to go further out into curve to get some more return. And the technical way that they're implementing this, at Bank of America at least, and they talk about this in their earnings call, is that they see they have a lot of cash and so they're buying treasuries, but they hedge the interest rate risk. And so that protects them a little bit in case there are changes in interest rates. But that's another way that these HQA portfolios combined with Basel III and massive QE can eventually actually exert some downward pressure on the wrong rates curve. So you would say at least some of the sustained low values and like say the 10-year treasury yield, at least some of it can be traced back to the story where these GSIBs and other investors are crawling gradually, marginally up the yield curve and just through arbitrage that is lowering the entire term structure. Yeah, it's definitely part of the story. You can see that very clear in the regulatory filings. The thing is, you have these investors who are constrained in what they can buy. So even though we might look at, let's say, a 1.2% tenure below the rate of inflation as unattractive, if your constraints are such that you can buy that or you can have five, 15 basis points at IOR, then you know maybe that's more appealing. But it does vary, though. So if you look at, for example, JP Morgan on their earnings call and on their regulatory filings, you don't see them doing this as much, they kind of want higher rates before they start doing this. But eventually, they'll probably have to buy short trees as well, though. So this mechanism does kind of put downward pressure on the longer dated yields. And maybe that's one of the mechanisms that QE is supposed to work. So Joseph, this is all very fascinating. And one of the points you mentioned about it was the Bank of America that purchased $400 billion worth of securities, treasuries, and agencies. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's what they show in the regulatory filings. Yeah, and that's recently, about. right? That's within what? Over the past year. Over the past year. Which is interesting because I've had these conversations with people who's buying treasuries now. Because if you look at the foreign purchases of treasuries, they've slowed down. I saw a, a tweet just the other day that they're picking back up in Q2. But so foreign purchases fell down now. So the more domestic purchasers, and particularly these big banks, are buying them up. So that's it's interesting. And again, it it flushes out the story that you're telling. One reason why yields continue to remain low on treasury notes and bonds is because of QE, this indirect story. This story, as we mentioned earlier, isn't the traditional story, but one that is definitely working to keep yields low. It's definitely a new development. Banks historically don't really hold that many treasuries and definitely not very far out of the curve. But that's a change that's been happening over the past year. So what it would take then to reverse that, to have overnight money markets go up on other assets then, so they would start pulling out of longer-term treasuries into shorter-term ones? You would need something like that to occur? Yeah. Well, if you think of this as a portfolio rebalancing story for the HQA portfolios of commercial banks, then yeah, if you raise the overnight rate, there'd be less of an interest. The trade-off wouldn't be as stark, so they might move a little bit back towards the overnight space. Yeah, so I want to step back and kind of make a meta point here, if I can. What's fascinating, I guess, Joseph, is that this is happening. And again, the Fed is contributing to it. This is the story here is all this liquidity is going in and it's driving yields down, short in on an increasingly up the longer end of the yield curve. Here's, I guess, the big question or what's puzzling or maybe fascinating about this is yields are going down. So the cost of funding or if borrowing, depending on where you are in the economy, they're dropping, dropping, dropping. Now, If there were like a huge productivity boom, and maybe we're in the midst of it now, a big surge in productivity gains such that the return on capital begin to surge, you could think, man, hey, I can borrow really cheaply, borrow short or even longer borrow and then invest in the real economy, invest in America Inc., right? There's a nice spread there between the return on capital and at some point, if this persisted, you would begin to see inflation take off, begin to see the real economy. We see some of that. I mean, I think we can debate whether the inflation is more supply side driven bottlenecks or it's due to demand shocks. But the fact, I guess what I'm trying to say, the fact that rates are going down so low and we don't see like really, really high inflation tells me that there's something else to the story. Yeah, the Fed is pushing rates low, but there's kind of a maybe a vacuum there. There's the return on the real economy may not be what it was to get those rates back up. I mean, that ultimately, the Fed can't force rates higher without causing a recession if there's no support in the real economy for that. Fair? Yeah, well, you know, I think inflation is kind of where you look. People are actually borrowing a lot as rates are low, but they're just not investing into the things that would cause Real inflation. If you look at, for example, uh, corporations, corporate bond issuance at all time highs that have been growing quite steadily. And it seems like they take that money and they buy back stock, which makes stock prices higher. But, you know, that is, I think, a form of inflation as well. Yeah. I guess my question is why aren't they investing those funds in like new plants, new physical capital, right? It must be because the return isn't there to do it relative to what they're getting from pleasing their shareholders. I mean, there's something missing. I mean, I guess the standard story would be, and again, this maybe gets down into what your theory of interest rates are, what ultimately drives interest rates. But if the real return in the economy is going up, 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 and rates are kept low and sustained low, then at some point you see imbalances emerge. And you're saying, oh, maybe the imbalances are emerging in asset prices. I guess maybe what I'm hearing you say what I'm saying is I would like to see more, you know, inflation take off, you know, the overheating of the economy. Now, again, some might say, well, it's right in front of you, Beckworth. Look at the inflation numbers. But still, those to me, they're high, but they're not like hot. They're not like you know, growing at, say, double digit pace. And the outlook seems to be that inflation is going to be coming down in the future. So I agree that there's this downward pull of yields and the Fed has a part to play in it. But is it only the Fed, I guess, is my question? Or is the real economy not doing its part to get you know the fundamentals up and running such that they would pull rates up and pull Fed policy to higher levels of interest rate? Oh, I see. And here's another way of looking at this. The Fed's doing QE, right? And it will dial back QE as the recovery takes off, right? That's the hope. And based on what you've just outlined, QT, quantitative tightening, should reverse this downward. But the fact that the Fed hasn't done it yet, it's a little concerned. 
there's something missing from the real economy, I guess, that's driving. And I guess, you know, you look around the world, you see low yields everywhere. I mean, this has been not a new phenomenon, the safe asset shortage story. But the story you're telling, which I think is important, fleshes this out, that the central banks have a big part to play in that and the mechanisms of getting rates down. I think you're right. It does depend on your theory of interest rates. If you think that the bond market, for example, is a reflection of, let's say, a lot of people having a view on the productivity and things like that, and that forms prices. And I think that'd be right. But, you know, many things form prices. If you look at, let's say, AMC, AMC issues more shares than they sell tickets, and yet it goes higher. And you can say the same thing about Tesla. And if you apply the theory of, let's say, more fundamental valuation, that wouldn't make sense. I would just think that, well, is the bond market really that different? I mean, once upon a time, when you had something, let's say, value-oriented investing in the 80s and 90s, they were applying kind of a similar fundamental view as to what drives asset prices. But if you follow that view, you would be very wrong. And things that were cheap became cheaper and things that were expensive became more expensive. When you switch to the bond market, I agree that there's a lot of people who look at things and put their view of productivity and inflation into bond prices. But fundamentally, it's just another financial asset and it goes up because people buy it. And people buy bonds for many different reasons. And you can have people like the Fed buying $80 billion a month because that's their mandate. And you can have people like foreign reserve managers buying it because they need to have a rain day fund. You have banks buying it because it's better than IOR. So it's hard to, I think, look at bond prices and infer fundamental things about the economy. I know that's probably theoretically how it's supposed to work. But if you look at the stock market, obviously that's not how it works. And maybe the bond market has some elements of that as well. And another way you can look at this is that if you look at actually the flows of uh, what's in the bond market, you have huge flows in the bond market. Part of that has to do with our aging population, right? So if we have more retirees, they're going to put their money in more conservative assets. Another way you can look at this is if you think about what happened in the past year, basically the treasury printed and gave away literally trillions of dollars to the people, right? That was funded by the Fed. And you can see this in M2 as well. The government gave a lot of people a lot of money. And that money flows into cars, it flows into stocks, it flows into houses, but it also flows into the bond market as well. So there are mechanical things that drive bond prices in addition to, let's say, fundamental views on productivity and inflation. And it's hard to say which is more important. Like I mentioned before, once upon a time in the 80s and 90s, if you were a value investor, you did very well in the past 20 years, not so much. It is hard to make sense of stock prices right now using fundamental theories and stuff. I will leave it at this. You know, if the mechanism is more important, if the Fed can just push yields down to zero, let's say the Fed keeps this up and let's say the entire yield curve goes to zero percent. OK, just for the sake of argument, imagine the Fed keeps it up no matter what. And if we don't see inflation take off, if we don't see all these things that I'm saying that are, should be there, then there's a free lunch. The financing costs go down, down, down. I mean, the government can finance its debt. Why not go down to negative, right? There's there's going to be a free lunch there. And I, I think at some point there isn't a free lunch. At some point, you know, wealth prices go up so much. There's a wealth effect that kicks in. At some point, people will start spending it. You keep sending money to checks to household. At some point, they'll be satiated with money balances and they'll start buying more, you know, real goods. Otherwise, there's just this free lunch sitting there. But I agree that the mechanism is, is very important. And I guess the way I reconcile this, because what really what we're dancing around here is, as you mentioned, the theory of interest rates. Do you have like a savings investment view of kind of desired saving, desired investment view of interest rates versus kind of a money market view of interest rates being determined solely there? And I think the two can interact. I think at the end of the day, what matters is what the central bank, what the body politic wants. If they want in it price stability, and that's going to, I think, connect the two theories. Let's move on because you've got plenty of other interesting stuff we want to get to. Let's move on to the overnight reverse repo facility. And you talk about that. You have a post called RRP and the ZLB. Very cleverly titled, by the way. I like that. Three letters on both of those terms. And as I mentioned, you know, we're over a trillion. Last I checked, $1.1 trillion. In my understanding of this, Joseph, is this facility originally supposed to be a temporary one, very kind of small use. The caps were real low, but now the caps have been enlarged and the counterparty list is growing or the new counterparties have been added to it. It very much feels like it's a more of a permanent growing facility that might be used on a more regular basis. So I'd like to hear your sense of it, especially as a former Fed insider and then also what you think is going on there. Absolutely. No, it's definitely going to be here. It's a necessary tool to control interest rates. 
I mean, without the RP over there, the dollar short rates would definitely be negative. What's basically happening right now is you can kind of think of the RP as basically a way for non banks to place deposits at the Fed. So, big picture, Fed is doing a lot of QE, right? And that is creating a lot of money. The thing is, now going back to restrictions under Basel, there's a leverage ratio that restricts, well, not restricts, it makes it costly for banks to have very large balance sheets. For you and me, we can basically go to our local bank and put in as much money as we want. We'll never get turned down. But when you have a lot of money, sometimes banks don't actually want to accept your deposits because one, it's costly for them from a leverage ratio perspective on a Basel 3. And two, depending on the type of depositor, that also incurs some extra costs. If you are, for example, an institutional investor, your deposit is actually more costly under Basel III than a retail depositor. And so because it's costly for banks to hold all this money, what they're doing is that they're pushing it out to a money market fund. So a big bank would basically call up some of their clients and say, hey, you're a great client. And have you heard of this great product called a money market fund that we have? So can you put your money there? And so as banks push out the QA created deposits into money market funds, money market funds then get stuck with a lot of money. Right now, they have uh, you know, four and a half trillion dollars and they need to buy something. And what they're finding is that there's actually not a lot of things to buy. So what they end up doing is basically just investing in the RP facility. Now, one note, of course, is that this again goes to our two-tier monetary system. When the money funds participate in the own RP, that decreases the reserve balances in the banking system as the banks settle that payment with the Fed on behalf of the money market funds. So in that sense, it's kind of draining liquidity out of the banking system and thus giving banks more room under the regulations. And so banks like that. But from the non-bank perspective, the people who hold liquidity, there really is no difference. Basically, instead of having a deposit at a bank, they have a deposit at a Fed that's structured in the form of a uh, reverse repo agreement. So what you're seeing there in the RFP is just a consequence of large-scale QE. It's uh, one of the side effects of QE is just having this enormous quantity of money and, and the RP makes that more bearable for the banks. And of course, it puts a floor on dollar rates in a sense, not a very firm floor. The RP has never been a very firm floor on dollar rates. What it does is it puts a floor on tri-party repo, which is a very big part of the US money markets. But the truth is the dollar system is a global system. You have people using dollars throughout the world. And you have people who need to put their dollars somewhere, even when the U.S. markets are closed. And so the RP is never going to be a floor for U.S. dollar rates, but it's a good enough floor that you can prevent a lot of the money markets from dropping to zero at the moment. So what you're saying is it's firming up the lower end of the Fed's target. Exactly. I mean, without it, we would be outside that target. I know in the past few years, we were going above target a few times at the end of the month, September 2019, we bounce above. And this is the case where we were actually drifting below. Had the Fed not made this more actively open and, and used. Now, you mentioned two ways of looking at this growth, this surge, this you know, $1.1 trillion. And I have a colleague, I think you've met Chris Russo. He also used to work at the New York Fed on the... Uh, market desk. And he thinks it could get as high as $2 trillion unless the Fed begins to quickly dial down. But whatever it may end up at, it's huge. And I like the way you, there's two ways of looking at it. I like the way you frame this. If you're a bank, from a bank's perspective, you can think of the Fed as injecting reserves into the system. They're also pulling reserves out. So they're taking the pressure off bank balance sheets that way. So on one hand, the Fed's putting in, on the other hand, it's pulling out. But from a non-bank perspective, you're just swapping the form of your assets. It hasn't changed anything for the non-bank sector, just particularly the zero lower bound. This is the key qualifier. At the zero lower bound, these are almost perfect substitutes, whether you hold a treasury or cash. You're getting 0% on bank deposits anyway. Yeah. So you're just swapping one, in fact, government liability for another government liability, which is something I think many people also miss when they get worked up about the Fed and its QE. I, I do think there are problems I'm going to speak to in a minute. I think it is important to note that reserves now pay an interest rate on them, as do treasury. So you're swapping. What you're really doing is changing the debt maturity structure. But I do want to step back and provide critique here, I guess. And I want to see how you feel about this. You mentioned, for example, that the overnight reverse repo facility, there's more counterparties, more people have access to it. In fact, you mentioned it's a way for non-banks to access the Fed's balance sheet, another way of looking at this, right? They can have deposits. So you can think of the Fed slowly opening up its balance sheet. And as you know, there's huge push right now to have Fed accounts. That would be the extreme case where you open the Fed's balance sheet up to everybody. 
But this is a step in that direction in, the, in that it's gone beyond just banks used to be the only ones that have access. Now there's GSCs. Now there's these money market funds. So you're growing the number of people who have access to the Fed's balance sheet. And if you approach it from that perspective, and then you look how big, again, this facility's usage is, is it fair to say that the Fed is becoming the money market or it's becoming the dominant counterparty in the money market to one side of every transaction? And is that okay? Or should we worry about the Fed being so dominant? I mean, this kind of goes back to what you're saying about the zombie features in the money market. Is this something we should be thinking about long term, thinking about is this the optimal strategy? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, you're right. I think the Fed is becoming an increasingly dominant player in the money markets. I mean, not just from the borrowing side, but also increasingly opening up, say, the sending repo facility to other counterparties. I think that's probably a necessary thing if they want to control short rates. The thing is, the US dollar system is there's a very large capital markets component to it, and it's a very global market, right? So without more access to the Fed as, uh, let's say, a place to put liquidity, it's very hard to control dollar rates. Uh, right now, treasury bills are below the RRP floor, right? So you have people who don't have access to the reverse repo facility who have to store their dollars somewhere, not just here, but throughout the world as well. If you look at the BIS data, you have about, say, $10 trillion in US dollar deposit, US dollar liabilities booked in foreign banks outside of the US. And so without greater access, I think, to the Fed's balance sheet, it's very difficult to have good control over the dollar rate simply because just relying on intermediaries is not, it works well. I mean, look at where the five basis point floor is. A lot of rates are around five basis points, but not perfectly well. And the more you do QE, the more quantity there is to control. I think that it makes it increasingly more difficult to police that floor. And, you know, you can have situations like right now where you have the debt ceiling where the level of bills is declining. And so that is also pushing down the pressure on dollar rates. So if you have more access to the Fed's balance sheet, say a CBDC or something like that, you really wouldn't have to worry about rate control as much. That's interesting. You raise this observation. I think the implication of what you're saying is, given the growth of global shadow dollar funding markets around the world, to the extent that Fed wants to control what's happening in those markets, it's almost forced to open its balance sheet more and more given there's these global dollar funding markets around the world. So in other words, QE is playing a role. As you mentioned earlier, QE is, is a reason why we need to open up the Fed's balance sheet. But also the growth of global dollar funding markets is another reason. Is that right, that the Fed's being pressured or has to open if it wants to have control? I don't know if the offshore markets are growing as much as they used to, but that is definitely part of the reason you have all these people who use dollars, who affect dollar interest rates, but are not within the purview of the Fed and cannot directly access the Fed. And so broadening access helps control dollar rates. Yeah. So dollar dominance, which is great for the U.S. in terms of cheap financing, you have senior ridge flows that come from this dollar dominance privilege. And it comes into private sector as well as the government. But in order to maintain it, I guess what I'm hearing is in order to maintain this exorbitant privilege, in order to maintain dollar dominance, the Fed's going to have to open up its balance sheet more. And it has opened up its balance sheet more, which is an interesting thought for me to chew on. We're just on the same way, just on the up. For example, we have the FX swap facilities that basically put a ceiling on dollar rates, right? That's the counterpart that prevents dollar rates from going too high throughout the world. You have swap lines with the ECB, the BOG, basically the major dollar markets, but you don't have any counterpart on the lower bound. So you can prevent, the Fed has enough connections into the financial system internationally to put a ceiling on short-term dollar rates, but the flip side, the lower bound, the RRP is not sufficient to do that. So if they really wanted to have a floor on dollar rates, then I think they'd probably have to open up their balance sheet more. You just mentioned another group of entities that have access to the Fed's balance sheet, foreign central banks. Many of them have already had access for a long time, but going back to the 1960s. But during you know this past year in, in March, when you were on the desk, the existing list was Bank of Canada, Bank of England, Bank of Japan, the ECB, and the Swiss National Bank. And then nine other banks were added. Again, going to this broader point, more and more entities or counterparties are getting access to the Fed's balance sheet, whether it's money markets or we're going to talk about the standing repo facility in a minute that right now it's primary dealers, but they're going to open it up to banks. Banks already have access via the discount window. But you have all these openings, I guess, on the Fed's balance sheet. And the big question is why? What's the big reason for the growing opening up of the Fed's balance sheet? And I think what I hear you saying is 
in order to control rates on dollar markets. If Fed wants to maintain rates, it has to have some influence throughout all these different entities that are actively involved in dollar money markets around the world and at home. That's exactly right, David. As you mentioned, the dollar is a global currency. Just to step back, as I mentioned earlier, you have, say, $10 trillion of dollar liabilities in foreign banks. And so one thing about the offshore dollar system compared to the onshore is that the composition of the liabilities is a bit different. The quality of the liabilities in the offshore system is not as good as an onshore system. Onshore, a lot of people have retail deposits, which, you know, no matter what happens, people don't really withdraw. We have FDIC insurance. But offshore, though, that's not necessarily the case. And so a lot of the offshore dollar system relies upon wholesale funding that can disappear very quickly in the time of crisis. And so what happens is that in the time of a crisis, that funding disappears and the offshore banks bid for funding. And that drives up interest rates, dollar interest rates that spills over to the onshore market. So it's basically impossible for the Fed to control short-term rates without also having a footprint in the offshore system. And that is, as you mentioned, the FX swap facility. That mechanism there is how. But it doesn't cover everyone, but it covers an enormous amount. And last March, I think, maybe last April, you saw the FX swap facility peak at about around $450 billion. It's doing a lot of work. There's an enormous amount of demand for dollars abroad. Yeah. So in other words, the Fed can't, you know, just cover its eyes and only look at the U.S. And, and that's its only focus. It has to be aware of what's going on abroad. And just to make this story concrete, so in March, the dash for cash, people were literally running to get reserves to get money in dollar deposits as well and get out of treasuries. And that included foreigners, right? It included banks overseas. And we saw what happened before the Fed stepped in. Treasury yields were going, they were spiking. They actually went up. So let's say the Fed hadn't opened up those dollar swap lines. So let's say the Fed hadn't, you know, set up even the money market facilities, commercial paper facilities, those have some kind of indirect influence on these foreign markets as well. So if the Fed hadn't done all that, we would have seen probably continued spikes in money market interest rates being felt here at home, even if they are pressure starting from abroad. So your point is well taken that given the global nature of dollar money markets, the Fed has to be mindful of what's happening and therefore keep its balance sheet open to counterparties around the world, which again, moves the Fed more and more in the direction of being the dominant money market participant. Okay, Joseph, let's move to the standing repo facility. So this is something that's been near and dear to my heart. As someone who has been and I'm not sure if you're familiar, if you've got this from listening to the podcast, but I'm someone who likes symmetric corridor operating systems. So like the Bank of Canada. So I like the more lean footprint. And the Fed had a corridor system. They had a, an asymmetric corridor system before 2008. It wasn't perfectly, you know, top and bottom. Um, it was by default zero at the bottom. So that wasn't ideal either, but it was more in the direction that I wanted to go. But in any event, in order to get back to that, and I don't know that the Fed ever will, the Fed's made a decision to stick with a floor system, ample reserve system, and you know that may be the way it is. But if there's ever any hope of getting back there, I think one piece of the puzzle is getting a standing repo facility. Now, you kind of shoot down this point I'm about to make, but one of the things a standing repo facility does is it makes it easier to view treasuries as more liquid. As It's easier to turn treasuries into reserves quickly and from regulatory purposes, that may mean banks have fewer demand for bank reserves. And if banks want to hold fewer reserves and the Fed can shrink its balance sheet more, not worry about creating problems like we saw, for example, in September 2019. So I think it's an important piece of the puzzle if you want to get there. I know that's not the reason the Fed has brought it online. They're not thinking about going to a quarter system. I hold no illusions. But nonetheless, that's why it's been near and dear to me is one of the pieces of the puzzle. But but let's talk about it. So it was introduced late July. You know, what's interesting, Joseph, is there have been many calls for a standing repo facility as well. I mean, people at the Fed have been talking about it. The G20 report came out recently. There was a Brookings task force that called for it. A number of prominent people, I believe Daryl Duffy's called for it. And the way I understand there's there's a fee of 25 basis points, a $500 billion cap. Is that all right? Are those numbers right? Okay. So it kind of sets the top. It kind of puts a, a ceiling in on the, on the interest rates at the very top. Is that right? It puts a ceiling on repo rates. On repo rates, all right, at the very top. So here's a question I have about it. And this goes back to you and your experience as actually working on the um, market desk at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And that is, I go to the website and I look this up. This standing repo facility is only open from 1.30 p.m. to 1.45 p.m., 15-minute window there. 
Now, it does say, quote, unless otherwise stated. So I'm thinking back to you back in September. It's seven o'clock in the morning. You're getting the calls. I mean, would this facility have helped you then? I mean, absolutely. It would have put a ceiling on repo rates back then. And, and, and like you said, David, it, it is a good ceiling on that repo rates, which bleed into other money market rates as well. The 130 to 145 window in the beginning, like the repo the Fed was doing was in the morning because that is when most repo was done. There's a good Fed blog post upon um, this. So when you're going into the afternoon, not a whole lot of repo is done. The intention of moving the repo facility to that 130, 145 time slot is to emphasize that it's more of a backstop. So just like moving the rate higher to, let's say, 25 basis points, which is far above market rates, moving it later in the day is to emphasize it's the role as a backstop. But yeah, it hasn't seen very much use. So I shouldn't worry about it being in the afternoon, even though like the panic was in the morning on September 2019. What you're saying is it's one, you got a signal it's a backstop. It shouldn't be your first go-to. The other reply I got to this, I mentioned this on Twitter and I got a bunch of blowback. They're like, look, David, just the mere presence of it being there, even if it's at 130, the repo dealers won't panic as much if they know they can go in the afternoon and go to the window. Is that a reasonable interpretation? Yeah, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Sentiment is a really important part of determining market prices and knowing that whatever happens, you can always go to the Fed at 130 is, I think it does help sentiment. Like I mentioned, if you had the repo facility back in September, even if it was in the afternoon, you wouldn't have that panic bid for funding because people would know that ultimately you could still go to the Fed. Note that though, the repo facility is only available to primary dealers and banks. And so you still have to rely on that intermediation process. And I think back in September, you might have had, let's say, smaller dealers who wouldn't have access to that to begin with. So it helps a lot, but it might not be perfect. It moves in the right direction. But it's not there. Yeah, yeah. So, hey, here's a suggestion. Why not expand the counterparty list and the standing repo facility over time? I'm guessing they probably will do that. I think that was in the recommendation in the G30 report as well, right? To have a repo facility with a broader counterpart. I think in practice, though, if you look at the financial system, you know, it's very much consolidated, right? So the primary dealers have a very big chunk of everything. So it works so well. But to get those cracks, you would expand that to the smaller dealers as well. So I think that's a really good idea, David. Is there any fears, though, about using that? I mean, what's the flip side? So the benefit is there's more stability in money markets. Is the flip side that hedge funds take on more risk? They lever up? I mean, is there any downside to the standing repo facility? Some of the things that people worry about, maybe it encourages moral hazard because you know you have this cheap funding that basically doesn't go away. But to counter that, I would say that just before September 2019, that kind of having repo rates spike out of control was kind of not on anyone's radar. So it kind of wasn't in the price to begin with. And I would also say that whether or not your decision to enter into a trade, it's only in part determined by your funding costs. There are other things that matter as well. And one of the ways you can see this is how repo rates have been floored basically at five basis points for the past year, but there hasn't been any growth in repo volume. So people really aren't relivering up. So there's a lot of considerations that go into this and of which funding is one aspect, but just one aspect. And, you know, you can always calibrate that in a way as depending on not just your counterparties, but what type of collateral that you accept right now, you're just accepting treasuries and other credit risk-free assets. I think that that risk is mitigated. All right. So that's the standing repo facility that for domestic purposes, the Fed also announced they're going to make the FEMA standing repo facility, the foreign Foreign international monetary authorities. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically the foreign central banks, international organizations, there are standing repo facilities. So they also introduced that one. So you wrote an interesting post on this and you called it quite humorously, the China repo facility (laughs) instead of the FEMA repo facility. So walk us through your story there. What's happening? Going back to the global dollar system that we mentioned and the FX swap lines that we mentioned, you understand that there's basically countries have enormous dollar needs, and that's usually backstopped by the Fed. But as I mentioned earlier, not everyone has access to the FX swap facility. There are pockets in the world that have enormous dollar needs and don't have access to the FX swap facility. And if you kind of look at around the world to see who that is, one country stands out, it's China. Now, data on the dollar liabilities of Chinese banks isn't that great, but the BIS observes that it's at least a trillion dollars, which is substantial. That's kind of mirrored in the treasury holdings of the Chinese sovereign. So if you don't have access to the Fed backstop, what you do as a sovereign is you self-insure. You basically have a rainy day dollar fund. And that dollar fund is held in the form of treasuries, which are credit risk-free money like assets 
Now, it's also hard to see just exactly how many treasuries the Chinese sovereign holds, but you can piece it together and, and you know, it's substantial. It's probably at least a trillion dollars. There's tick data. There's also China's own disclosure of its foreign reserves, but it's at least a trillion dollars. Usually, if there's a run on dollars needs from Chinese banks, the sovereign can backstop that, even without the FX swap facility, by selling treasuries and using those proceeds to into their banking system. And that works as well, as long as the treasury market functions. Now, when the treasury market doesn't function, like it did last March, then everything breaks. You can kind of think of treasuries as kind of, you know, it's like people basically deposit their dollars in treasury securities and expect to withdraw them in the same way that we deposit dollars into a bank and expect to withdraw them anytime that we want. However, if we go to a bank and we can't withdraw those dollars, we panic, right? And it's a run on the bank. The same thing happened last March. People held treasuries, wanted to withdraw dollars, realized they couldn't. And so they started selling everything else they could to get dollars. And again, that has financial stability concerns and also rate concerns, right? And you start borrowing, not just selling your dollar assets, but you start borrowing the market and the Fed might lose control of short-term rates. And so the FEMA repo facility was first announced temporarily at the end of last March. So, you know, the FEMA, they hold in custody about $3 trillion in treasuries on behalf of the foreign central banking community. So they kind of know if someone is selling a lot of treasuries and if they are a foreign sovereign. So you can kind of infer from that. And I think there are speeches given by New York Fed officials later to the same extent that part of the reason that the treasury market broke last March was that they were selling by foreign central banks. Now, if you have access to the FX swap facility, you won't be selling your treasuries to meet your dollar needs. Because when you access the FX swap facilities, what you do as a foreign central bank is you kind of create your foreign currency out of thin air and swap it with the Fed. And that's always much easier than just selling treasuries because you can create foreign currency yourself and that's costless to you. So last March, you saw the FX swap facility participation go up to uh, 450 billion, but you saw FEMA repo participation hover around zero, which is where it's always been, maybe 1 billion as a test trade. So knowing that if you have access to FX office facility, you would never use the FEMA repo facility. The FEMA repo facility is really for people who have dollar needs, don't have FX swap facility access, but have substantial treasuries. And there's only one country for that, and that's China. And so I think the policy goal there is one, to help protect the treasury market such that if we ever have another scramble for dollars, you won't have a lot of people selling at the same time. And that way, maybe if you could have the option of repoing your treasuries with the Fed to get dollars, you won't sell them outright. And I think that protects the treasury market so that there won't be such a panic. I think that's important to stress that point that this facility, even if you want to call it you know, the China repo facility, this facility is about preserving the U.S. treasury market. It's not about helping China. It is helping China, but it's not about lending a favor to China. It's ultimately about preserving the treasury market. And I stress that because I could see how this could easily get politicized, right? You get people who are worried about what's happening in China. They say, why are we helping China with this facility, this repo facility? And I think that the reply is, it's about us. It's about our treasury market. We want to keep this market up and running. Do you want the government, U.S. government to still be able to pay its bills? You know, do you want to function I think that's the way you got to sell this. Is This could be a very delicate issue, uh, and I think how you market it and sell it, and I think you did a great job doing that. Absolutely, Dave. I would also add that the participation in FEMA REAP is not public, so you can get on the H4, you can see, let's say, how much it was. So that helps a lot, too, but I'm sure that if Congress wanted to, they could get access to who is participating. Well, Joseph, our time is near an end, but since we've been focusing so much on money markets and the important role treasuries play in them, I just want to ask you your thoughts on proposals to reform the treasury market. As you've said many times today, the treasury market blew up in March of last year in kind of a standard package that you hear from different folks. I mean, again, multiple sources, G30 report, the Brookings Task Force, Daryl Duffy, many others is threefold. And they were slightly different, but generally three points. One is get a standing repo facility, which that's now done. Cross that one off the list. The other two, though, is to have a increased use of central clearing in the treasury market. And then the other thing would be to make bank balance sheets have more capacity to absorb treasuries and give out reserves if they need to in a crisis. And or vice versa. And that would mean permanently removing reserves from the supplemental leverage ratio, the SLR, which the Fed temporarily did. And then it, you know, it is now considering it on a more permanent basis. So what are your thoughts on those other two suggestions? Would they make a big difference? And would they have solved the problems in the treasury market in March 2020? 
I think those two proposals go up to the balance sheet aspect of dealers and banks in general. So one of the concerns last March is that maybe there wasn't enough balance sheet for dealers to make markets. So what happens is that a dealer purchases security, holds it, and then sells it to someone else, right? They, they need balance sheet to hold that. And when you have central clearing, it conserves the amount of money that you need to make payments. And if you have SLR relief, then theoretically, you could hold more treasuries on your balance sheet. And those two both matter. But Looking back at last March, I think the New York Fed blog post has a very interesting blog post noting that dealers that were under SLR back then didn't really behave all that differently from dealers that that were. So one of the things that happens is when you have volatile markets is that dealers pull back kind of as a prudent risk management, right? Because market prices are just, it's not necessarily a balance sheet capacity issue or not necessarily a funding issue, but when you have markets moving around, you could get caught off guard and you can lose a lot of money. So I think that those two measures, all the everything proposed in, in the G30 report helps, but you know, last March was kind of exceptional when there was so much selling. And I think probably it might be like a, a constraint that when you have a growing debt market, but you have a dealer system that's not growing in proportion, there's going to be some kind of mismatch. The pipes just aren't wide enough to do all that intimidation if selling is severe. So I think the performance all help, but probably would not have been enough to do anything last March. I mean, Fed had to go and buy a trillion dollars in over the span of a few weeks, a trillion dollars of treasuries to, to make everything function again. One of the ways you can broaden out pipes in addition to those proposals is to have more dealers. But even then, you're saying probably not a trillion dollars in a few days. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was so big, so quick that maybe nothing would have solved it. It's truly a one in a hundred year, you know, shock to the system that's so large. We say that a lot in 2018 and stuff, but I think it happens more frequently than we care to admit. I mean, in terms of a pandemic, a pandemic yeah. about once every, who knows, it could become a regular too. But your point is the shock is just so unprecedented, it's so big, so large. And the Fed had to buy so much in such a little bit of time that all these proposals may not have been enough. Well, thank you, Joseph, so much for coming on the show. Again, listeners, check out his blog at fedguy.com and his book, Central Banking 101. Joseph, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, David. Delighted to be here. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.